Ivan Pavlenko, From Family to Family, Chapter 3, Part 5.2, Working as a Storekeeper, read by Natalia Buzova. A society was gradually formed in the village with which I celebrated various holidays, New Year, Christmas, as well as May the 1st, Victory Day. Those were teachers, Dmitro Grivorovich Strizhak, Kirill Antonovich Teslenko, Alexander Grivorovich Marchenko, as well as Stepan Mikhailovich Sokolovsky and Ivan Andreevich Romanenko. All of them were with wives. We met as a rule at school or in nature. And one day, as they say, in the middle of a weekday, Ivan Andreevich, the farm party organizer, and Kirill Antonovich, a teacher, came out from behind my barn in the evening. And they looked at each other somehow mysteriously. I saw that both of them had bottles of vodka or wine sticking out of their pockets. I understood that they were intended to drink. But on what occasion? Kirill Antonovich approached my ear. We want sausage. I laughed, remembering how I had previously boasted that sausages in cans could be stored for a long time, filled with lard. I had to bring one liter can from the cell, heat it in a pan and put it on the table. And then somehow Ivan Andreevich came to me with a bottle of champagne, which we didn't know and had not tried yet. I whispered to him that sure I would go to the river bank to wash, and then we would drink. She was getting ready, and I looked around the house, remembering where the bread, lard, tomatoes, knife, forks were. So just she just left the house. I put everything on the table, and Ivan Andreevich quickly unscrewed the cork. But suddenly the champagne kind of exploded. Ivan covered the bottle's throat with his palms and it hissed, tearing. He shouted, hold. I pressed his hands from above with mine. And then Shura was on the doorstep. She came back because she forgot the prank for washing. She was standing and could not believe her eyes. So we got caught, as they say, in the middle of nowhere. Over the years, I had the chance to be godfather to Andrei Halivets Klunakov, <clears throat> to Aunt Yakim, who succeeded Zayetz as head of the village council, to Halka Halayova, and to Olga Pantalimonova. I also attended the wedding of Uncle Andrei Ivan and Dunya, Uncle Maxim's Fedir and Resha, Aunt Ulitas Mikhailo, Mitrofan Hekman, Stepan Sokolovsky, Yegor Samilenkovi, and Hanna Merechin. And I left my mark on each of them. You can't describe everything. I will tell you how I hung a red flag, a sign of virginity, on the very top of a tall willow tree in Hanna Marechina's yacht. That flag hung for a week and no one dared to climb that dangerous peak to take it down. After all, the willow is brittle in winter. It can break down. The father of the bride came to me and asked, Manko, take down the flag. Otherwise, the head of the village council summoned me and said, what's wrong with you, Nikita? There is some republic in the yard that flies the flag. Take it down or cut down the willow and the district authorities will see it and it will be a problem to me. When I got to the willow tree, I looked up and thought, and how did I get there in my boots? Nevertheless, I climbed near the very top. I stretched my hand up, untied the rope and threw the flag down. And I carefully descended to the ground. There was already a pint waiting for me on the table at home. Most often I was invited to various parties, probably because of my cheerful disposition and singing voice, which I did not lose until old age. Maybe I had a tinned throat. I want to recollect with a kind word my fellow villagers, ordinary uncles who, regardless of any problems, were by nature from my grandfather, great-grandfather, cheerful people capable of all kinds of pranks, like those Zaporozhians who wrote a letter to the Turkish Sultan. It was always crowded near the granary and the firehouse. Every morning, <clears throat> Collective farm workers gathered here for the so-called 
orders. There, the head of the collective farm and foreman ordered where to go and how many laborers should be sent and gave personal orders to those who came. But there were always people there during the day and evening. They gathered as if in a club, regular lovers of gatherings and smoking breaks, pranksters and jokers. They made fun of their superiors, pranked fellow villagers who passed by, especially those who did not know how to react to human. Сашко Михайль, Турлай, Василь Кумпан, Дзвонко, Михайло Солонуха, Борисенко, Трохим Солонуха, Євгененко, Іван Йосипович Павленко, Калита, Захарко Шостак were the great masters of such a raffle and from the young Митрофан Гетьман. They played subtly and wittily. If, for example, a certain Vasilio Paraska were jealous, then when Vasily approached, the conversation about his wife seemed to be cut off, whom the foreman or someone else had begun to visit for some reason. And if Paraska was approaching, then it was already about her husband, who was courting a young woman there. They spoke in such a way that Vasilio Paraska had something only out of the corner of their ear, and then everyone fell silent as if that sinful conversation had never happened. And there were those who were hooked. That was already a love. Once in a fall, watermelons were brought to the storehouse. Men were sitting next to them and exchanging remarks when Sashko Mihal turned up. He liked to laugh at others, but then they decided to make fun of him. Vasil Kumpan and Zahar Koshostak whispered something to each other, and then they took a large watermelon and started to argue whether it was ripe or not. They bet on a bottle of alcohol, and when Sashko approached, Vasil said to him, Sashko, push our handshaking apart. And he asked, and will I benefit? You will. They both answered. Sashko separated their hands with his hand, and the two of them showed their figs right, in, right under his nose. Here you are. Everyone around was laughing. After all, they made fun of Turlai himself, who could do that to anyone, but no one had yet been able to play him over. Such pranks were played almost every day. Those raffles had their own rules. An outsider would not be affected, only from our environment. And woe would be tied to those who did not understand humor, was offended. They would be played over more, would be laughed at and cursed. Well, swallow the pill and keep quiet if you don't know how to answer back with the same witty word or deed. Successful raffles sometimes became the property of the whole village. People remembered them for a long time and laughed like adult children. One of them is about the commissioner of the district committee and Fedor Shupa. Such a man lived in the village. He was below average height, strong and wiry. Wherever he was sent to work, he went there. He did everything his wife said to him. He himself was silent and somehow helpless, as if he had been hit with an empty bag from around the corner. But his wife, Hannah, was short, but shrill and tenacious. So Feder was under the thumb of his wife. On the collective farm at that time, there was a representative from the district Kolmachov. So he approached the man and asked if there was a barber in the village who would cut his hair. Sarko Turlai right away advised him, you see the sad house, Fedir Maketovich Shupa lives there, so he can cut and shave. It's true he likes to drink, but you won't have to pay him. The authorized person went to the indicated address and the men were holding their bellies laughing. He went into the house. A man, unshaven and barefoot, was lying on the pill. A pill is a wooden bed. His legs were black with the soil and above him, flies were flying in a swamp. Hello, said the authorized representatives. Uh, the authorized representatives greeted him. Be healthy, grumbled Feder, getting up and scratching his back. Would you, Feder Makitovich, do me a haircut? What? 
I'm asking if you could do a haircut for me. People advised me to contact you. They made this up. I have never held scissors in my hands. Here the commissioner realized that the man had simply sent him to make fun of him. He left the house and went to the granary, but there was no one there. Women were also not indifferent to such rifles. One day, a handsome chicha came to our place and asked Shura, exchange me eggs for a city hen. They say that your hens are laying eggs and non roaming and I just have a problem. Everything in the garden has been raked with their claws over. I've already cut their claws. It doesn't help. It turned out that the woman had been at the street meeting and shared her troubles there. And someone jokingly said to her, swap the storekeeper's eggs. He has lain and non-roaming hands. It was a hint that the woman had not given her chickens grain and that the storekeeper had enough of it, which is why the chickens laid eggs and did not rake with claws. But the woman took it at face value and came to us with her eggs. At the end of this section, I will say a few more words about how the fate of Mitrofan Hetman, who was not only my closest friend, but the godfather of my son Grisha, turned out. In 1948, Mitrofan got married. He took Olga Kozlova as his wife. There was no traditional wedding, but Shura and I were at the party. After the wedding, Mitrofan began to build a new house. I helped him with wood and gave him some products as craftsmen worked. The hut was almost ready when Mitrofan was suddenly arrested, along with Musi Strelcevi and Tatiana Lazarova who was away at the granary. Mitrofan was carrying grain from the field to the granary with Musi. They unloaded the last cart with wheat already at night at their home. Someone noticed and reported. A total of six bags weighing 400 kilograms were found. It was as if Tatiana did not allow them, but they either did not listen or persuaded her to keep quiet. At the trial, both were sentenced to eight years and Tatiana to 12. I gave Mitrofan some groceries and my boots. He said goodbye to Olga. Don't cry and don't wait for me, but get married if someone happens. Eight years later, a strict Stalinist article was removed from the criminal code and Mitrofan returned home, took his Olga to the place where he served his sentence to Norilsk. But I will tell you more about his appearance in Yashk. One evening, Shura and I were sitting at home when the door opened and a stranger in a smart suit entered the house wearing a hat and tie. In his hands, there was a wand, and on his eyes were dark glasses. He walked in like a secret agent or a thief and said nothing. I looked closely and exclaimed, Mitrofan, is it you? Shura also recognized him. We laughed and hugged. Why are you wearing dark glasses? I asked. To hide from F's. He answers and giggled with a laugh I had known for a long time. Already at the table, he told us that he was spending time at the copper smelting plant in Norilsk. And when, after Stalin's death, they were released, he stayed to work there because of the fact that freelancers were paid a lot of money. In a few years, he collected some money, got dressed, and arrived on vacation for two months. On the very first Sunday, Mitrofan organized a party at his place. We were with Shura and some of the neighbors. Anna, his elder sister, also came from Sveridivka with her adult son, who worked as a carpenter on the collective farm. When Mitrofan's mother had been left alone, she asked him to make the door to the new house. He did it, but took 300 rubles for the work. And now Mitrofan, in his style, was preparing a surprise for him. We sat down at the table and drank some alcohol. Then Mitrofan brought a new quilted suit into the living room and said to me, try it on. I put it on. The suit was perfect for me. So it sparkled with a steely color. Here's to you, my faithful friend, 
for not sparing me your boots on the long journey and for helping my parents. And to you, he turned to this very dear nephew, for extorting 300 rubles from my mother for the door. Here you are. And he showed him a thing. Mitrofan was like that, and I tell you exactly how it was. For several days, I walked around the village in that costume with Mitrofan. We also visited Lofitz and sat in a restaurant. He fully in uniformed my son and his good son, Grisha. He bought a suit, a shirt, and boots for him. Meanwhile, Mitrofan's vacation was ending, and he began to prepare for a long journey. Shura and I thought and wondered what to give him as a souvenir. And we decided to give two embroidered Rushniks and Shevchenko's kabzar. He came to say goodbye to us. Shura hung her best towels on the walls and said, here, choose any two that you like. He began to look around and she prompted, maybe you will take this one with corn flowers. The Rushnik was beautiful, but shorter than the others. Well, Mitrofan did not say that it was short, but answered as usual, figuratively and wittily. Once, he says, two good friends got together. One of them decided to give the other a gift. He laid out a dog made of pure gold on the table and asked, so do you like the dog? And his friend answered, yes, the dog is good, but the tail is crooked. Shura burst out laughing. He chose a pair of rushniks and I handed him a brand new kobzar and said, when longing for your native land overwhelms you, you will open this book and feel as if you had visited Ukraine because no one has described it like Taras Grigorovich Shevchenko. That was our last meeting. He never returned to his native village. He worked in the far north for 10 years and then went to the Kuban with a friend, bought a house there and lived there for a few more years. And at the end of the 70s, he suddenly died. The heart gave up. Obviously, seven years of hard labor and unhealthy minds took their toll.